This Great Lakes prepping video isn't exactly a prepping video. Um, if you've seen any of my other videos, there's a good chance that you've seen uh, this little dog show up somewhere in the background or maybe playing the part of taste tester depending on the video. Um, so this is Lena and um, I wanted to make a video about her story because um, it's, it's kind of a it's kind of an intense story as far as dog stories go and since she's become an unofficial and occasional mascot of my videos um, I thought I would share the story with her uh, share the story with you rather um, now uh, I'll get into it a little more but something to know about Lena is that she's very scared of things she's very on edge she's very scaredy of noises, um, wind, rain, anything like that. And she's been like that pretty much since I've had her. And because of that, um, I tend to keep a TV or radio on uh, pretty much all the time. If I'm not home, there's a radio on. If it's supposed to be windy or rainy that day, I'll leave a radio and a TV on. Just anything to help sort of drown out the sounds. And because of this, any time that I shut the radios and the TV and those sorts of things off, she's automatically more on edge because she starts to be able to hear the outside world. Um, early on, I thought that she'd get used to these things and I could kind of condition that, that fear out of her, but um, that's not how it works with her. It's just not going to happen. And because of the other details um, that make uh, her kind of a really sad story um, I pretty much spoil this dog in every way possible she pretty much gets um, whatever she wants because she's been uh, robbed of a lot of joys that ordinary dogs get I'm glad to see that she's kind of relaxing and just letting me do this video um, I, I kind of thought that she'd get up and run away by now because when she's scared she moves around she goes to different places she never settles in one spot because it's still scary over there, but um, she'll move from the couch to the bed to the other room, back and forth. Um, I also decided to shoot this video uh, out here on her normal couch because she doesn't much care for the room that I normally shoot the videos in. I see she's going to try to get up right now, so uh, I might stop this video and then start it up again when she decides to come back. Well, she's back for now, but we'll see how long that lasts. Um, so, uh, I got Lena about um, five and a half years ago. Uh, it had been a couple years since my last dog passed away, and I was feeling uh, I was feeling like getting another dog. So I started looking at uh, all the the adoption websites and PetFinder.com and all that, and. Um, we saw the listing for her. Hey, don't lick your butt on camera. Um, so we found her on the website and I called up and they said, sorry, uh, she's actually just been adopted. Um, well, that's a bummer. She seemed super cute and was about the kind of dog I was looking for. Um, but whatever, that's how it goes. Well, a week later, the rescue called me back and they said, I know you were interested in this dog. And by the way, the rescue named her just about the worst name I've ever heard in my life. And sorry if there's any human out there that's actually named this. But they named her Edwina, which is just, just awful. So, uh, so I ended up renaming her Lena. Anyway, they said, you were interested in Edwina, right? I was like, yeah, I believe she was adopted. I said, yes. Uh, the man who adopted her brought her back. Uh, are you still interested? And I was like, well, yeah, of course. Then I thought, uh-oh. Why did he bring her back? What's wrong with her? Well, it turns out this guy was a lump. It, was, it wasn't anything that she did. This guy just didn't know anything about taking care of a puppy. Uh, when I got her, she was six months old. And that's still pretty puppyish. So I'm guessing he took her home, slapped her in a crate, and then was shocked to learn that puppies whine and cry when you leave them alone in a crate. 
um, and he brought her back. That's what I'm guessing. I don't really know. And this website would post pictures on their, their or the rescue would post pictures on their Facebook page of, uh, of their rescued uh, animals and the person who, who adopted them. So I was able to see a picture of this guy with, the, with, with my dog on their website. And uh, I didn't know anything about him except that he brought back a, uh, an adorable puppy because he didn't know what he was doing. Anyway, um, so I went and met her and uh, we, we went into one of those little rooms and, and one of the people that worked there was was uh was there kind of watching us and um immediately i i sort of fell in love with her she was super cute just a, a silly little puppy and um i think the the employee really liked me because the first thing i did was get down on the disgusting animal rescue floor and roll around on the ground with her um so i think they liked me um i uh so i ended up adopting her and I took her home a couple days later. Now, I wish they'd have mentioned um, from the beginning that she had a couple of uh, medical issues. They didn't mention it until I had already signed the papers and gave them the $200 for the, the fee. And as I was on my way out, they said, oh, by the way, um, she's currently got uh, an infestation of something called Demodex, which is a type of uh, skin mite. And she's also um, infected with Gerardia, which is an intestinal parasite that's very hard to get rid of. Um, would I have still adopted her if I knew that? Yeah, I, I'm sure I would have. But it would have been nice to know that. Anyway, um, getting rid of Demodex and Gerardia basically involved a lot of very, very expensive medication administered over the course of several weeks. The Demodex cleared up quicker than the Gerardia. The thing that the, the killer about Gerardia is that um, it, it keeps coming back. It, it, uh, dogs tend to reinfect themselves because it's in their uh, it's in their poop. So if they come into contact with any residue or anything, um, even from licking their own butts or anything, they can reinfect themselves. So um, when we could not get rid of it, I had to basically clean every linen in the house steam clean the carpet uh, every time she went uh, and did her business outside I had to collect it up and make sure to dispose of it and then basically scour the area with um, with water and uh, I can't remember if there was some kind of chemical I was supposed to pour on it I don't remember that part I also had to basically wipe her after each time with a baby wipe just to try to clean the area so finally after another couple of months she came back clean on the Gerardia. So that was good news. Um, now, to, to back up a little bit, um, we did some, some Googling just out of curiosity about her and found out some of her story from before I ever met her. Um, she was rescued from uh, some really terrible house somewhere around here. I don't know where. I don't know who it is. They don't release that information. Luckily for them, I don't know if it was an animal hoarder or just some scumbag of a person, but um, uh, somebody that knew um, the woman who, who owned her um, reported her to uh, maybe the Humane Society or the rescue, I'm not sure, and they came and basically seized her. Uh, they took her and she ended up at the, at the rescue that I got her from. Um, Basically, the, the vets that were examining her thought that she was probably three or four months old. Uh, then they found out or determined somehow that she was more like six months old, but her growth was so stunted from the conditions she was living in that she was much smaller and much less developed. Uh, basically, when the rescue seized her, um, they found that she'd been living in a small cage in a basement with... Um, basically no food, no water. She was never let out. She was malnourished. She was dehydrated. She was severely underweight. And she had chemical burns on her body and her eyes were swollen shut from 
basically sitting in her own urine 24 hours a day. That's a puppy. That's the first exposure to this world is just constant pain and suffering. Um, uh, I'm going to sort of uh, intermix some photos and maybe some video clips into this video that, that are relevant to the part of the story I'm telling. We found a newspaper article online that actually had a picture of the woman who physically rescued her. It showed her carrying Lena out of this house wrapped up in a towel. And you can see that her eyes are swollen shut, this tiny puppy. <clears throat> so anyway, the rescue took her in and she stayed there for, uh, I think, about a month. And they brought, they got her weight up a little bit. They got her a little, a little socialized. And at the time that I adopted her, she seemed like a completely normal and happy puppy. She was very, um, very happy. She wasn't particularly scared of everything. A little bit. Always scared of wind and rain and things like that, but not scared of people, not scared of other animals. Um, very social, a happy dog. Um, but, uh, but around the time that she kind of became, I'll say, full grown, she started to develop a lot more neuroses. Um, frankly, I was surprised, though, how good of a dog she was considering the early part of her life. She was housebroken so fast. She was uh, obedient. She could. She was just so trainable. Um, never chewed anything up except for a couple of occasions. And of course, puppies are going to chew something now and again. But when you showed her what she did was not okay, she remembered it and she was okay. Um, in her world, the worst thing that could happen is for me to use my disappointed voice on her. Um, she'll never do it again. It's crazy. Um, considering the, the terrible upbringing she had the first few months, she, she, um, seemed like such a well-adjusted dog. Um, like I said, she has since developed more neuroses. Uh, I think she might have some kind of, uh, neurological issue because, um, sometimes she just looks around the room like there's bugs flying around but there's nothing there. And I've tried to research it a lot and I've found some other people, actually a lot of people who've been seeking answers to similar things with their dogs. And a bunch of people said that they noticed that it seems to be worse when it's humid, when the barometric pressure is, is a certain way, you know, uh, weather related. And so I started taking more notice of it and sure enough, she only ever seems to do that in the warmer months when the temperature and the barometric pressure must line up in just a certain way that it messes with her. And she looks around the room for maybe an hour until she finally just lays down and goes to sleep, but just looks around or digs her nose into the bed like she sees something in the bed or, um, I don't know. It freaked me out at first. I thought she was uh, schizophrenic or something, but. Uh, I never really found any answers, but it doesn't seem to be debilitating to her, and it's more of a minor weirdness, one of her weird quirks, um, and it pales in comparison to the other problems she has. Now, I haven't gotten to her number one um, problem. Uh, so, like I said, the first six months I had her, she seemed like a perfectly healthy, normal dog, but as she grew... I, uh, maybe around the time that she became full grown, I noticed that suddenly she was, she was running around outside and she started not running on one of her back legs. She had her leg per perfectly straight, kind of sticking out behind her as she ran, still wagging her tail. Um, and I didn't know what it was. It seemed to go away and then, then it would happen again and then again. And then after a while, I noticed sometimes it would be the other leg. And so I started Googling it and, and eventually I took her to the vet and, and they confirmed what I suspected from my Googling. And they said that she has something called patellar luxation or a luxating patella in both knees. So bilateral. What that means is um, the kneecap is supposed to be right in the center. And as you bend your, your, your knee, um, the kneecap sort of slides back and forth 
along a groove in the bones um, that, that are on either side of the knee. The femur, and I can't think of the other one. And some dogs have an abnormality where that groove isn't deep enough. And that can be compounded with the main um, ligament that moves the kneecap is kind of in the wrong place. It's attached just slightly off center. And that ligament is under incredible tension. So as you bend your knee, the kneecap comes completely out of place. It, it just slips right out of that groove. And um, when she was laying down and she was relaxed, I could physically, like with my fingers, move that kneecap in and out of place. Didn't seem to hurt her. Didn't seem to bother her. She let me play with it as much as I want. The problem is, is that if she was moving around and then it suddenly popped out of place right as she was about to put a bunch of weight on it, it would be, it would cause terrible pain and she would yipe um, and then limp around for the next couple weeks. So talking to the vets, they said um, there's different stages. There's stages one through four. Four is when it's always out of place. Three is when it kind of slips in and out of place constantly. Her knees were both rated at a three. And they said, you know, a lot of people do surgery. Um, they, they choose surgery and that's, that's the permanent fix. If you had, if she was rated a one or a two, I would say no surgery. Don't worry about it. But when this thing slipped out of place so much, it's going to end up causing arthritis. And by the time that she is middle-aged, she could have terrible arthritis. So we waited, it was probably another year, maybe year and a half before it progressed enough to where I said, all right, we better do the surgery. I was completely nervous. I was worried sick about it. Um, but I went to a very highly esteemed um, animal surgery place in this area. Now, luckily for me, when I first got her, I signed up for a pet health insurance policy. I always thought those were pretty ridiculous, but um, I was in the financial position to be able to afford the $40 a month or whatever it was. And uh, my previous dog had suddenly gotten sick some way, well, way back when, and it cost thousands of dollars out of pocket that I didn't have at the time. Um, I had to borrow money and max out credit cards and stuff just to save his life. And I know I would do that for her too, but I decided, you know, preparedness being the name of the game, to get this um, health insurance policy. And I decided to go with a company called Truepanion because I liked the terms of their coverage best. So I got a policy that cost $40 a month. It's gone up a little each year. It's, it's more than that now. I can't remember how much, but for $40 a month, it would cover 90% of an injury or an illness. Um, and I have a $200 deductible per uh, injury or illness, not per year. So she's, she's had years and years of care for this knee issue now, and I still have only paid that deductible one time. They cover 90% of the surgery and of um, medications and, and treatments and lots of stuff. So we decided to have the surgery done. Um, they recommended doing both knees at the same time because both knees were affected. It wasn't going to help that, you know, she would just put all of her weight on one side because both knees were bad. So we said, let's just pull the bandaid off, do both of them at once. It's going to suck more, but for less amount of time. So we had that, we, I, I had the surgery done. I think it was somewhere in the neighborhood of four thousand dollars which of course 90 percent of that was reimbursed by true panion um honestly they've they've paid me back so much money that i i feel like i should call them and, and tell them i'll do a, a commercial for them or something if they want i mean i know that they just upheld the side of the deal that they said they would uphold but still with insurance companies you kind of always expect to be screwed but they, they, they held up their end. Anyway, um, we, we, knew, we knew what to expect as far as her recovery. Um, it was going to be 
long and slow and terrible and she'd have to be confined and at first she would need help walking to go to the bathroom um, by use of this this sort of fabric sling that you'd tuck up under her belly and hold on to these little handles to just sort of take some of the weight off of her back legs. Um, she hated that. She also had to be in a giant cone, which she hated even more. Um, and I left her in her 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 halter, uh, her harness thing um, for, for months because I needed to easily be able to kind of like hold her and hook a leash to her and that kind of thing. She didn't mind that. She doesn't seem to mind wearing the harness. Well, um, so most of, I, I took the, the, the following week off of work and I just laid there with her. I actually relocated my bedroom into the living room, which is the room I'm in now, because the room's big enough that I could have her enclosure next to my bed and be right next to her all the time. So I pretty much hung out in the, my bed in the living room for months. It shouldn't have been months, but things didn't go so smoothly. About two weeks after the surgery, we were, I was finally starting to feel optimistic. I was so nervous the whole time that I wasn't able to eat. Um, I, I lost a bunch of weight. She lost a bunch of weight. You know, she was all discombobulated from the anesthesia and, and so forth. And she wasn't eating much. But finally, she started to seem like she was kind of kind of getting there. Her, we knew it was going to be about a six-week recovery, and by week two, she was able to kind of stand up and turn around and, and just not seem so terrible. She wasn't on the fentanyl patch anymore, so her brain wasn't completely just foggy. Well, I got home from work one day, and I was coming home every day for lunch and as often as I could and having other people come by to check on her when I finally went back to work. But one day I got back from work and I come in the door and I see her walking towards me in the kitchen, which doesn't make any sense because she's locked in this big enclosure. Now this is a dog that could just sort of stand, could just sort of walk. She got out of her enclosure. Then I started looking around and it looked like an absolute murder scene. There was blood everywhere. She walked into nearly every room of this house, just, I don't know why, and, and splattered blood on everything. Um, I realized I didn't really talk about what the surgery entailed, so uh, I'll touch on that. Um, the surgery was two parts, and this is on each knee. Um, using some kind of grinder tool, I assume, they're going to deepen the groove in the actual leg bones, the groove that the kneecap slides in. But the, the, the bigger part of the surgery is, I mentioned that that ligament is attached in the wrong place. It's, it's off to the side. So what they need to do is detach one side of that ligament and move it over a little bit. It's probably a tiny amount on a, on a leg that small. But you can't really detach a ligament and reattach it to bone. But what you can do, and this is just horrifying, is use a tiny bone saw and cut off a whole hunk of bone that the ligament is attached to. Move that hunk of bone over a little bit and then pin it back into place. The majority of the recovery of the surgery is letting those, that piece of bone properly fuse in its new location. It needs to just reattach itself. The pins are gonna hold it into place as best they can. Well, this surgery obviously involved a big incision on each knee. And they stitched it up and glued it all up and everything, and they were perfectly solid, um, you know, solidly closed incisions. Well, when she somehow climbed out of this enclosure, she must have scraped her knee across part of it or whacked her knee on part of it, and it just split wide open. The incision split completely open. Now, I can't imagine what it must have looked like when she climbed out of that thing. You know, we're talking an enclosure that's, I don't know, three feet tall. This dog can't jump. She can barely walk. And she somehow army climbed out of that. And then when she got to the top, she must have just plummeted right down, you know, to the floor on the other side. I don't know. So there's blood everywhere. 
I'm just losing my mind. I wrap the thing up and get the bleeding to stop, and I call the surgery center because they're also a 24-7 emergency center. They said, if you can stop the bleeding, it's probably fine till tomorrow. If not, bring her in now. Well, I stopped the bleeding, so I wrapped it all up with gauze and one of those um, sort of sticky bandages. I don't know what those things are called. And took her in the next day. They said, ah, she seems like she's okay. We'll staple it back up and then uh, send you home. Um, and then, then come back in two more weeks to check her out. Well, about a week later, I could tell something wasn't right because when she would be finished using, you know, doing her business outside, I would pick her up and, and carry her back to her enclosure. So I'd pick her up out back and walk over and set her inside. Well, I don't know if it was just the weight of her own leg kind of dangling as I was carrying her or what, but she started whining while I was carrying her. And by the time that I set her down in her enclosure, she was screaming. I can't even describe... There's not even a word for the noise she was making. It was screaming. And I didn't know what it was. I had no idea what was going on. And she, when she's a dog's panicking, they want to get up and move around and bounce around, which was surely making it worse. So I finally got her to lay down. I had to kind of hold her down. And over the period of a next, the next, well, it seemed like forever, but it was probably only a minute. She kept screaming. Finally, the screaming sort of subsided and she's just laying there panting and and was so stressed and was in so much pain she just leaned over and threw up everywhere so now there's a giant pile of throw up to deal with so the next day I took her back to the vet I, I told them what happened and so they did all the x-rays and everything again and said uh this really sucks but the the surgery on her right knee completely it like completely wrecked the surgery the the whole thing shifted the pins bent um it's completely in the wrong spot now so i'm sure some combination of the bone moving and the pins bending and the ligament being in the wrong place all of that together uh, uh must have been more pain than than i could even imagine so i said well what are we going to do and they said well we have to go in and redo the surgery on that leg like immediately. So, okay, well, okay, let's do it. I mean, what what choice did I have? So that was another two thousand dollars, most of which <laughs> her insurance policy paid for. And they said we're gonna do a couple of extra things in there to make sure it doesn't move again. We're gonna add this wire that somehow wraps around something or other, and put the pins back in. Well, they didn't do a good enough job. I don't know if they should have used bigger pins or used different pins or new pins or what, but they used the same pins in the same original holes. And sure enough, the thing moved again. A couple weeks after that, well, maybe more than that, there was another screaming episode, but it wasn't it wasn't nearly as bad, but it was it was similar. I took her back in and they said, Yeah, it moved again. The pins moved again, and it's just it's in the wrong place. Well, what do we do? She said, they said, well, we can't really do another surgery right now because there's just everything so little in there. These pieces of bone we're talking about are so tiny that we just can't keep, you know, putting holes in it and putting pins in it. It's everything's too loose now. We almost, we actually have to wait for this thing to heal wrong and then like recut the bone off and do it all from scratch. Or we can just let it heal wrong and see how she, how she deals with that. And of course, I'm just sickened by all this. I'm so sick because of what this poor dog's been through. I'm regretting every second of the decision to do the surgery. Um, so she screwed up the first surgery on the right knee. They botched the second surgery on the right knee. And they came just short of admitting it. They didn't admit it because I'm sure they're not allowed to admit it. But they kind of admitted it. And so a lot of her aftercare from that point on, they didn't charge me for. I mean, that's the least they could do, I guess. So they said, you're just going to have to let it heal in the wrong spot. And hopefully she's not in too much pain from it. Um, you know, she's on these anti-inflammatory pills that are also painkillers. 
And uh, so for the next couple months, I laid in that bed and she, uh, of course, I swapped out that enclosure for a real cage so she couldn't climb out of it. I laid in that bed every moment that I was home and she laid in that cage and I kept her sedated as I could and I went to work and came back as often during the day as I could and came back after work and laid in that bed and very, very slowly she started to be more mobile and wanting to walk around and so I would let her in the bed with me. I would let her sleep in the bed with me. Um, I would let her go walk to the other side of the room and lay in the sun. Um, months and months of this, just so gradually to the point where she was able to move okay <clears throat> and not seem like she was in constant pain. Uh, now, um, let's say, uh, so th the surgery was, I believe, May 1st of that year. I guess about almost three years ago. In November, I put my bed back in my bedroom and turned the living room back into a living room. And she was healed enough to jump up on the bed. I have a pretty short bed. I just have a platform bed specifically for her. She can jump on the couch. She seemed as healed as she was going to get. The x-ray said that the bones had fused in the wrong place, but fused. Um, in December, she started having problems, and they said, uh, well, a couple of the pins have loosened up. And they, they knew from the beginning that sometimes these pins loosen up, and they have to then remove them. So she had to have another surgery to have these two pins removed, which, very minor surgery, but it's still cutting her open and pulling this big pin out. Two pins. Um, so it wasn't bad. It didn't affect anything except the meat on her leg. So that just needed to get stitched back up. Um, of course she didn't want to keep those stitches in place. And, uh, and even despite wearing a cone still managed to undo all the stitches one night while I was sleeping. So that was great. Um, so May 1st, uh, June, July, August, September, October, November. So six months from the surgery to when she was in any kind of shape to kind of carry on in any almost normal way. Uh, and that's, that's about how she's been ever since. Um, she walks around, she runs if she feels like running, she jumps if she thinks she needs to jump, but if she overdoes it just a little bit, she's super, super sore and extra limpy for, for a week or two. Um, she's not supposed to run. She's not supposed to jump. Um, sometimes uh, I can't get a handle on her and she goes just tearing around the yard for no reason just because dogs want to be crazy dogs. But every moment of the day with her is an exercise in dog management. What can I do that will prevent her from running around um, one of the things that will cause her trouble is if she's laying down and wants to stand up and she does it as quickly as possible, like any dog would just suddenly just scramble to their feet. Well, that abrupt, sudden pushing of that right knee, sometimes she'll yipe and then she'll be limping and, and in terrible pain for the next couple weeks. I got to put her on more painkillers that I have. As it stands, she takes this anti-inflammatory called Rimadyl every single day, and she takes this expensive glucosamine something or other chewable every day. Um, if she's having a really bad week, I give her this other painkiller and maybe even a, a part of a sedative so she'll just stay calm and sleep it off, so to speak. Um, but it's, it's a huge bummer, and it's completely unfair to her that she's, in a lot of ways, not allowed to be a dog. She can't be around other dogs because she wants to get hyper and play with them. She can't be around little kids for the same reason. Um, anytime somebody comes over, um, they know that as soon as they come in, they have to go and sit down at the kitchen table so she can just gently come up and get used to them being there for a minute. Because otherwise she wants to jump and bounce like a crazy dog. 
So her spirit is normal. Her her mind, as far as being a, a dog of her age, is normal. But it's heartbreaking because there's no way that she can understand that or why she's not allowed to act like her mind wants her to act. A human might be depressed by that, but they'll understand it. They understand why they can't do these things because they'll hurt themselves. She doesn't understand that. Um, so her life is pretty boring. It's kind of sad in a lot of ways, and that breaks my heart. So we go for short walks, very short walks. We go for walks around the yard. I've got a pretty big you know, yard here. Um, but if we leave the fenced area, she has to be on a leash because she's going to start running around and being silly. Um, uh, it's very uh, hard for me to go out of town because driving in a car is very hard for her. Um, being in my truck, bouncing around, she won't stay put. She won't just stay laying. Um, and there's so many things that go into the daily care for her that um, most people can't do it. Um, so if we go out of town, there's just very few options that uh, for people that are, you know, that I want, that I'll even expect to take on this burden and who I can trust to do it right. There's only a couple people that I, that I trust even remotely to do it. So um, right now she's a little over six years old. She's been dealing with the, the aftermath of this surgery now for almost three years. Um, she walks around. Uh, if, when, she, when she doesn't need to stand, she lays or sits. Um, when she wants to get back up, she gets back up. She doesn't stand her feet for very long at a time because of it. Um, when she is standing, she's either putting most of her weight on her left leg or standing up on her tippy toes on her right leg. Because again, the ligament's in the wrong place. That that rubber band is stretched uh, in a way that it's not supposed to be when her feet and knee are in a position um, that it would normally be in. So for her to feel comfortable walking, she's on her tippy toes on that leg. So eventually that's probably going to lead to hip problems. It's going to make, you know, of course, knee problems. Now the surgery on her left knee worked pretty well. That knee does not luxate anymore. Um, but she puts most of her weight on that knee. So how long until that knee it starts having bad problems again? I don't know. Now, I mentioned that she takes this anti-inflammatory every day, and it makes a world of difference in the pain she's in. I mean, it's, it's night and day before I started giving it to her every day again. There was a while where I would try to wean her off of it. So she just takes it every day now. And the thing about that pill is that it's been known to um, cause liver and or kidney damage in dogs after prolonged use. Normally older dogs that have chronic arthritis get that pill, so it doesn't really matter because by the time their organs would have problems, well, they're already a pretty old dog, you know. So with her, she has to get very regular blood work to make sure that it hasn't started to affect that. Um, ultimately, it, 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 it probably will start affecting her organs. And that means a couple things. It means she has to stop taking that pill, which means that she's going to be in way more pain all the time. So where's that point where I have to make the decision of do her organs fail or is she in, does she, can she not walk anymore? And it's really upsetting to think about, but when the day comes for that decision, that's probably going to be about the time when a bigger decision has to get made because I'm not putting her through another surgery. Um, I won't put her through it. And I guess selfishly, I won't put me through it. She's had too much pain and confusion and just a really bum deal in her little life, especially considering how crappy her life started and that she completely came back from it as a, a happy and normal dog. Mostly normal. So everything's kind of an ordeal. She gets scared. She wants to move around. The more she moves around, the more her legs hurt. So everything's an exercise in keeping her calm and, and comfortable. Um, she doesn't have a lot of joys in life, so she's spoiled. I give her uh, some of everything I eat. 
She's a very skinny dog. She's always been very skinny. I'm not too worried about her being overweight from it. She's, in all honesty, in all honesty she's not going to live to be 15 or 16 years old anyway. I can just, I can just accept that as, as truth. So in the meantime, she's getting a couple of bites of, of everything I eat, and she's getting, uh, she's getting bones every single day. Every day I give her a, uh, one of those hollowed out cow femur bones filled with peanut butter and crushed up milk bones and whatever else. She sits there and, 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 and chews on that and licks the filling out of it for about an hour every single day. And I have created a monster because if I ever do forget, uh, uh, you know, what time it is, if I forget that it's bone time, um, you know, I'll hear it from her. She'll come and stare at me like I, like I'm just a war criminal. Um, but she gets it. She gets everything that she wants that I can give her, considering her limitations. So. Um, I know you've been mostly staring at a sleeping dog throughout this video, but uh, that's what she does a lot of. And like I said, I'll try to mix in some pictures and videos throughout this thing so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, this is, uh, I'm sure so far, the longest video I've made because it's kind of a long story. Um, but that's okay. You don't have to watch it. If you're interested, I guess you will watch it. Um, that's it for now. Um, Support your local rescues. Don't pay for uh, purebred dogs if you can if you can rescue one. Um, that's it. I'll see you next time.